On the morning of June 21st, 1967, Commander Peter Cobb was relaxing in his office. HMS Dreadnought S-101 was undergoing maintenance in Gibraltar, and his crew was on shore leave. Cobb then received an urgent message. He had 24 hours to get Dreadnought ready to embark on a special mission against the Soviets. The United Kingdom's first nuclear submarine had been built as an urgent request due to the increasing nuclear threats from Russia. However, the British didn't have the necessary resources to pull it off, and resorted to a joint effort with the United States. The collaboration was met with significant pushback, but the construction went smoothly and marked the beginning of a new phase of defense development in the long history of the Royal Navy. It was now time for Dreadnought to live up to her powerful namesake. Nuclear Vessels In the early post-war period, the United Kingdom's Royal Navy began researching potential designs for nuclear propulsion plants. Appreciating the potential of nuclear-powered submarines, an initial paper was then presented to the Institution of Naval Architects in 1948, with a study following the next year. The early research considered bulky, gas-cooled reactors as used in the nation's civil nuclear power generation. However, the project was halted in 1952 after six years of studies in favor of more pressing Cold War-related projects. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the United States Navy conducted its own nuclear research with water-cooled reactors, achieving success with its prototype reactor in 1953. This led to the official commission of the world's first operational atomic submarine, USS Nautilus, two years later. Nautilus marked a turning point in nuclear research and set the stage for such protocols for years to come. During subsequent joint exercises with the Royal Navy, the submarine demonstrated plenty of advantages over the British anti-submarine forces, which had developed extensive anti-submarine warfare techniques by the 1950s. The Admiralty, which was the government department responsible for the command of the Royal Navy, recognized the benefits and potential of such a vessel, and decided to resume its plans to develop its own nuclear-powered submarines. After much consideration, Flag Officer Submarine Sir Wilfred Woods and Admiral the Earl Mountbatten of Burma decided that a lot of time, effort, and money would be saved if their own vessels accepted American nuclear technology. However, several U.S. Navy top brass, including Rear Admiral Hyman Rickover, were against the transfer of technology. It wasn't until a visit to Britain in 1956 that Rickover and all the detractors changed their minds and withdrew their objections. The decision was then expedited due to the excellent relationship between Admiral Mountbatten and Arleigh Burke, the United States Navy Chief of Naval Operations. That same year, Her Majesty's Treasury approved the development of a shore-based prototype nuclear reactor, aiming for it to become functional by 1960 and installed onto a submarine two years later. British engineering firm Vickers was appointed as the main contractor, with roles as a subcontractor in charge of the nuclear reactor. Joint Effort In January of 1958, prompted by the surprising launch of Russia's Sputnik satellite, the United Kingdom and the United States signed the Mutual Defense Agreement. Among its many clauses, both parties agreed that the United States would supply the United Kingdom with nuclear submarine technology and a complete propulsion plant, the S-5W pressurized water reactor. To ensure success, the joint team decided to perform an expensive and lengthy process that included building a land-based prototype to test the nuclear machinery and then build the submarine. Thus, personnel from the Admiralty, Vickers, and Rolls-Royce traveled to the United States to learn about design, installation, operation, and maintenance techniques for the specific machinery. Significant effort was also put by the two nations to ensure there were no mismatches between the American and British technologies, and all the nuclear machinery was shipped across the Atlantic once the personnel finished training. The communication flow and team effort between both parties was effortless, and all issues, big and small, were quickly identified and dealt with. The construction of a full-size wood mock-up of the nuclear reactor and machinery began in northern Scotland in a joint effort between Rolls-Royce and the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. Due to the S-5W pressurized water reactor's features and specifications, the British submarine needed to be more or less identical to USS Skipjack, an American ship that used the same reactor, with a full rounded bow and tapering stern. Vickers Shipbuilding also welcomed the American establishment Electric Boat Company, the Skipjack creator, to collaborate in the design. This collaboration process also went quite smoothly. The end result was an attack submarine with the primary objective of hunting down and destroying enemy submarines. And although the submarine's machinery was all American, the remaining equipment was British, including armament torpedoes. She was equipped with state-of-the-art devices for enemy detection, navigation, and communication. Because of the submarine's pivotal underwater endurance, comprehensive air conditioning and purification system, and accommodating quarters for all officers and crew members, she had a much higher standard than her predecessors. A 
powerful namesake. HMS Dreadnought S-101 was laid down on June 12, 1959, and launched by Queen Elizabeth II on Trafalgar Day on October 21, 1960. She was the seventh ship from the Royal Navy to bear the name Dreadnought, the first dating all the way back to the early 1800s. The weight of the name was undeniable, as most of the namesake ships achieved great success and many firsts in Royal Navy history, including one of the first ironclad turret ships, the first large warship with turbine machinery. The fully operational nuclear reactor was installed on HMS Dreadnought in 1962, and the submarine was officially commissioned into the Royal Navy on April 17, 1963. It was all on time and budget, due to the successful collaboration between the two nations. In addition, the vessel became the United Kingdom's first ever nuclear-powered submarine, and Dreadnought represented the peak of British military engineering technology in the post-war era. Royal Navy Service During a decades-long career, Dreadnought proved to be a reliable vessel, carrying out dozens of missions around the world with only minor issues. Throughout the early and mid-1960s, the visits included trips to Bermuda, Kiel, Norfolk, Rotterdam, and Virginia. In June of 1967, HMS Dreadnought was finally able to use her guns, albeit in a friendly manner. On the morning of the 21st, while the submarine was stationed and afloat near the Gibraltar coast and most of the crew were on shore leave, Commander Peter Cobb, the ship's captain at the time, received an urgent message to get ready to sail within 24 hours. During a conference call between the top members of the crew and UK officials, it was revealed that a German tanker, the Esberger Chemist, had broken in half just south of the Azores, a region in Portugal, and was in grave danger of drifting to land, while also being a hazard to shipping movements in the area. Although the submarine was afloat, the saltwater pumps that cooled the nuclear reactor were turned off, and some of the main bow sonar was being repaired. Still, the captain agreed that they could be ready within 24 hours. Word quickly spread around Gibraltar, and the crew members on leave promptly returned to the submarine to prepare to sink the Esberger Chemist. On June 24, 1967, HMS Dreadnought arrived in the area, along with HMS Salisbury acting as a guard ship, and three of the submarine's torpedoes successfully hit the target. Months later, in September of 1967, the nuclear submarine left Scotland to complete a sustained high-speed run to Singapore. The round trip covered 4,640 miles surfaced and 26,545 miles submerged. During this trip, HMS Dreadnought rescued 35 survivors from the wreckage. Then, on September 10, 1970, the submarine completed her first major refit at Recife, where the nuclear core was refueled and several noise-reducing modifications were implemented. During her service, Dreadnought also achieved a significant first when, in March of 1971, she became the first British nuclear submarine to ever surface at the North Pole. Six years later, in a team effort, along with frigates Alacriti and Phoebe, she was deployed to the South Atlantic as part of Operation Journeyman to deter a possible Argentinian aggression against the Falkland Islands. A life well spent. Apart from minor problems, such as slight hull cracking, Dreadnought was a reliable and popular vessel with her rotating crews. In 1980, with significant machinery damage and limited refit facilities for nuclear fleet submarines, the iconic British vessel was officially withdrawn from service. The submarine remains at Rosyth Dockyard, laid up in a float storage until the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense's submarine dismantling project makes a decision on a safe disposal method. In 2012, a campaign was launched in hopes of turning the ship into a tourist attraction when a complete decommissioning is completed and the ship is safe to visit. And although the nuclear fuel has been removed, most of her interior remains intact, almost as if no time has passed since the submarine crossed the waters decades ago. Ultimately, HMS Dreadnought S-101 the United Kingdom's first ever nuclear submarine provided the Royal Navy, Rolls-Royce, the American Navy, and other companies with valuable experience in skills and capabilities for nuclear design maintenance and operation. As the Royal Navy seeks to replace their current Vanguard-class nuclear submarines, it's no surprise that the military branch has decided to name the new submarines as Dreadnought-class. Thank you for watching our Dark Seas video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and leave us a comment below. And for more exciting historical content, subscribe to this and all the other channels from our Dark Documentaries family.